All right, everybody. So Tulsi Gabbard, presidential candidate, is suing Hillary Clinton for defamation. And she's asking for compensatory damages to the tune of millions of dollars and an injunction prohibiting the further publication of any Clinton's further defamatory statements. This, of course, in reaction to Hillary insinuating or really saying directly that Tulsi was a Russian asset. Joining us now to discuss all of these things is Kyle <laughs> Kalinske, host of The Kyle Kalinske Show and great friend of our show. Great to see That's you, right. sir. Good to see you, Kyle. Good to see you guys, too. All right, our legal eagle for his analysis today. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of this yeah, move by Tulsi? So, you know, I, believe it or not, I'm actually um, pretty split on it. On the one hand, I'm happy that, uh, you know, somebody's standing up to, honestly, the thuggery of Hillary Clinton and her team. Um, so that's always good for what it is, just at face value. I like that. Um, but on the other hand, listen, there's like thousands and thousands of people who've been le levying that obviously bogus and wrong charge against uh, Tulsi. And honestly, Hillary Clinton wasn't even the originator of it. The originator of it, I believe, was an article in NBC News. And again, for the record, just so everybody knows that it is insanity to claim that Tulsi Gabbard, who is a U.S. veteran, is somehow, you know, working for Vladimir Putin simply because she wants peace in the Middle East. Um, but I think this is, and I love Tulsi, and honestly, I think she should be Bernie's vice president. But I do think this is a little gimmicky, and I don't <laughs> think um, she's even going in it necessarily trying to win. I think that this is just to kind of make a statement and, and plant a flag and say, no, you're not going to get away with accusing me of this. But here's the thing, somebody, uh, you know, I've been a public figure, I've been out there in the public eye for a while. People are going to say all sorts of things about you. And, you know, if you take the things that are terrible, even the things that could be genuinely defamatory, and you go after people for it, it's not going to make any difference whatsoever. So based on the fact that Hillary wasn't the originator, and based on the fact that also, let's be honest, it's so hard to prove a defamation case, man. Right. When we talk yeah. about, when Especially we talk when about you're a public speech, figure. Yeah, when we talk about free speech, it really does include, like, yeah, you could pretty much say anything about me as long as it doesn't hurt me to the point where I could prove damages. Yes. And as much as I love Tulsi, you know, this is no different than any other smear um, that would give a minor reputational hit. So, yeah, I do think it's a little too gimmicky, and I, I don't think it's going to work, but I also just like the fact that she's going after Hillary, which is something that's super important, and that's why she should be Ver Bernie's VP, is that she is willing to take on the right and not pull her punches, and she's also willing to take on the corporate Democrats and not pull her punches. Mm -hmm. she's, and she's the fighter. only person. She's the only person who would be the attack dog who punches in both directions, and Bernie clearly needs that, so Tulsi should be VP. Yeah, let's tease that out, Kyle. I, I, I saw you tweeting about this yesterday, which is that you think that she's the only person. The VP is the attack dog, and particularly in a Sanders campaign, who you know has has his own problems whenever it comes to apologizing and kind of playing nice with his uh, with his opponents. I, there's no way Tulsi Gabbard is going to do that. She obviously has no qualms in taking shots. Do you think she would be? I mean, do you think the conventional wisdom in Washington is like, oh, the VP, they got to come from a state that's important and you know bring in uh, voters? I don't think any of that is true. So you think that her ability just to punch back would make her a real asset to the campaign uh, going forward if if he were to win the nomination. Yeah, that's like the most important thing. And mm -hmm. you know what? The, the media is going to give him crap for it because they despise Tulsi Gabbard. But that's one of the things that makes me want to pick her more is because, yeah, the media is always going to make noise around the, you know, the lefty candidates that are the most impactful. They don't want, like, left-wing change. They don't want anti-establishment change. So whoever they're going after the fiercest is probably the one you should consider the most. And yet again, I want to remind people, we're in the Trump era. All the rules that you thought applied don't apply. He is such an unorthodox candidate, an unorthodox president. And, you know, lean into the fact that the media doesn't like you. Lean into the criticism. Say, oh, yeah? You don't like me? Well, hey, like me now when I pick, you know, my VP candidates, the right. only person on the planet you hate more than me. Yeah. How you like them out? <laughs> I think that's well said. Well, I agree. I mean, you. also on yeah. the electability front, she's the one candidate who has uh, almost the most demonstrated ability to win over independents and Republicans precisely because she is willing to punch in both directions, and that's tremendously appealing to people. It's funny the way that 
On the one hand, the media will say, oh, we have to have a candidate who will appeal to disaffected Republicans and independents, and that's why we need a moderate like Joe Biden. And then we have a candidate who actually does have support from Republicans. They dismiss her as that somehow like nefarious and suspicious that she's been able to win people over. Yeah, it's really funny because the thing about Tulsi that actually is one of the things that I'm most critical of is the thing that will probably be one of the biggest assets, namely that I think oftentimes she does the fetishization of bipartisanship and acts like that's the end all be all. When, you know, my position is it's not inherently good or bad bipartisanship. The details matter. But what she does is all the time in her stump speeches, she'll talk about how bipartisanship is lovely and wonderful and we need more of it and all this stuff. And that annoys me, but that's, you know, that's rhetoric that absolutely will chip away at Trump voters and right wing people and independents and moderates. And like, so the thing that kind of annoys me about her is another thing that's an asset. And the point is, she's not going to go along to get along with the establishment Republicans and with the establishment Democrats, but she will make a strong appeal to the actual voters that's wherever right. they fall. I so, yeah, right. I think that she she's a, a, a really, really – she would be a really strong VP pick, and I think it's exactly what he should do, which is why I'm not sure he's going to do it. So to play devil's advocate here, Trump picked Pence because he could bring – he could, like, sort of comfort the social conservatives in the Republican Party. Is there an argument for Bernie picking a more – a figure that the establishment is more comfortable with to calm the waters mm. there? No, not at all. Because um, I think that she has she has an appeal that can cut both ways. So you know she can get the left by talking about how she's her health care bill is the closest to to Bernie's. You know she wants to end the wars. These are all like strong left wing ideas. Um, and then the appeal that she could make to. to I, I don't think you need to make any appeal at all to the actual establishment. I think that. You need you need to try to make an appeal to chip away at independents and moderates and right leaning voters and disaffected Republicans, and that's what she does. So in well, other I words, think it's yeah, about, I think that's right. I think it's about who do you want to be in the party, right? Do you want to realign the party around the multiracial working class, or do you want to continue keeping the sort of you know white affluent liberals in the fold who would be maybe most uncomfortable with a Bernie Tulsi ticket? And to me, you know, the direction of the party I would like to see going in is that multiracial working class direction. So from that standpoint, it matters who you pick, and I think Tulsi would be better for that direction. I think that. The establishment really is a paper tiger. So you, my point is you don't even need to make head fakes about let's appeal to the least liked people in the country. Right. And I think that a, a Tulsi pick solidifies that mentality and verifies that mentality and leans into the fact that actually, no, all these you know people who are yelping on, on mainstream media, you're irrelevant. You're super irrelevant. So we're going to lean fully in the other direction. And that's why I think Tulsi's a good pick. That's right. And, you know, I just uh, from my own perspective, the reason that Trump picked Pence, it's not because the establishment liked him. It's because evangelicals, the key voting bloc, right. was actually suspect of Trump and right. his credentials. I don't think a similar block like that exists on the Democratic Party. And so I do think that if you wanted to realign it how you're talking about, that Tulsi definitely could be somebody hey, who could do can that. Can I ask you this, Kyle, really quickly? There was uh, Ryan Grimm reported that they had uh, they had investigated whether Elizabeth Warren could be both vice president and treasury secretary. At this point, how would you feel if he made that choice? You know, listen, I was one who was actually predicting and saying quite a bit behind the scenes that I thought Bernie was going to pick Elizabeth Warren to be VP. And I thought that that's why he didn't really lay a glove on her up to this point in the race. And, um, you know, after seeing how everything unfolded, I don't think he would pick her to be VP anymore. However, I do think he would pick her to be, you know, Treasury Secretary or, or something else in the administration. Mm -hmm. And um, that, listen, this is, it's a strength and, and a liability for Bernie because he's such a principled guy and he cares so much about the issues that he's going to pick people for the positions that he thinks should be in the positions that align with his ideology. But like, yeah, on a personal level, though, now you look at Elizabeth Warren and it's like, oh, my God, like, really, this is this is who you are. This is who you, so the worst 
the worst characterizations of you all along were the accurate ones. Right. And now, you know, Bern Bernie's going to still give an olive branch to you when the time comes. And it just shows how big of a person he is and how little of a person she mm. is. And I think I think it would affect me and I'd be upset. But at the same time, I could eventually get over it and be fine with a Treasury Secretary pick. I don't think I'd like a VP pick right yeah. now, to be honest. Yeah, there's a trustworthiness question there at this point, a loyalty question there. Um, Kyle, always great to have you. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. See you, man. We'll have more rising for you after this.